Byro Sports Talk. I'm, of course, your host, Byro. And just a few things I just wanted to say again, reiterate it, since I know I'm still freshly new. Um, so I'm here. I want to, this is a generalized sports talk podcast, uh, vlogcast. Uh, hopefully, down the road, I can get SoundCloud Pro so I can actually upload all these episodes again. Uh, notice SoundCloud stopped after a while, thus why I'm not on SoundCloud anymore. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, Facebook. Uh, there's a Twitter account that leads to the YouTube. And from that, let's go ahead to some quick topics. So, first thing I wanted to make note of was the LA versus Paris Olympic debate. Apparently, they came to a conclusion and ended up being exactly what the Olympic Committee wanted, which is Paris to host the 2024 Olympics and LA to host the 2028 Olympics. Now, was there a reason for it? Um, really, the only reason for putting LA to the later one was so that Paris could have it before LA. So essentially, it was the world saying, uh, we want France to have another Olympics before we let the United States have an Olympics. And I, that's all it really is. And I mean, it's all politics anyways. So moving on. Uh, something that just happened recently, which was, it's going to be butchered. I want to say it's Vladimir Klitschko, but it's with a W, so Vladimir Klitschko retires at the age of 41 years old from boxing. And if you don't remember who he is, he was one of the Klitschko's brothers that had a big, long, undefeated streak. Uh, his ending record was a 64-5, and five, but for the longest time he was the world champion of the WBO, WBC, and I'm sorry, I'm not, let me pull it up real quick, I have it right here, it was the WBC, was his brother Vitaly, however, Vladimir was IBF, WBA, and WBO champions. And he was undefeated for 11 years, it says. So, there you have it. Uh, again, just wanted to hit it real quick. Uh, another topic, and this is going to be a dual topic, but I only have it marked as one. So, John Jones came out and called out Brock Lesnar. And the reason why this is going to be a double header is because so did Chris Cyborg of UFC for the women's side. I'm trying to, I just want to double check her last name because I've only ever heard her called Chris Cyborg. <laughs> so let's look. Yeah, it's not coming up for me right now. But here, I'll have it right here for you. It's Christine. I want to say it's Christiane Justino. Um, but a lot of people just call her Chris Cyborg or, or Cyborg Justino. Uh, so why she's brought up with the John Jones, they both called out WWE fighters that have MMA backgrounds. So Becky Lynch, who has a little bit of a jiu-jitsu background and Brock Lesnar for of course for the John Jones comparison. So the excitement I have for both these is wouldn't it be crazy? I know this the cyborg Becky Lynch one is planned for SummerSlam, however the Brock Lesnar John Jones one is planned for UFC. And more and more lately, UFC and just MMA fighters in general are crossing over this line into the WWE. And, I mean, it's not bad. 
I would like to see some other people get involved. So like a Conor McGregor actually going up against some people. Uh, but again, that's about all it's, it's just going to be what it is. They apparently have some sort of an agreement for crossovers. So like if you're a WWE superstar, you can also be an MMA superstar. But next topic. So another thing that happened this, this week, Adrian Beltre has hit 3,000 hits. He's the 31st person to hit that milestone. And of course, the hits leader, Pete Rose, is still not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, another big topic around Beltre was that someone was claiming he was on steroids. It's not proven. It's not fact. It's just a news reporter saying, uh, I'm not saying he is on steroids, but he kind of looks like he's on steroids. Uh, another thing that happened this past week was the Hall of Fame inductions for the MLB with Jeff Bagwell, Tim Raines, Pudge Rogery, as if you don't remember him. He was a great catcher. Uh, John Scherholz and Bud Selig, Claire Smith for the Writers Award, and Bill King for the Broadcasting Award. So all of those people honored at the Hall of Fame this week for MLB. Uh, Bud Selig was the commissioner when we were, well, I say we, I don't quite know her, my viewing on it, audience, I guess. But for my generation growing up, he was the commissioner for the longest time. Uh, I remember Pudge. I remember Jeff Bagwell as well. Uh, there was also an interesting article of players that deserve to be in the Hall of Fame that will never get a chance. And I must say my favorite player of all time, Kenny Lofton, was the top of the list. And it was interesting to see. They said he would normally be an 80% chance person to get in but since he didn't make it past the first ballot it's going to be a rough road for him to continue so I mean there's a lot of things going on I know I have a bad habit of rushing through things but I just also like to talk about all the topics as I can I'm not very good at pacing myself so so the MLB standings, Boston's up one game on the Yankees, Cleveland's up two and a half on the Royals, Astros are up 15, Nationals up 12, Cubs up two and a half on the Brewers, and the Dodgers are up 14. Now, for the first time this week, I wanted to go over the wild card standings also, because as it's August, we're getting closer and closer to that October World Series, so let's go ahead. <laughs> so the American wild card. Looking at it, you have the Yankees, who are right now the number one seed. The Royals are number two, and they're up only a half a game on the Tampa Bay Rays. So the Royals need to pick it up in order to distance themselves from the Rays. Now, the, this next one will be interesting, the National League, because when you look at these, how teams are doing, you don't, you didn't hear these two teams at all. Because the team in their division is just running away with the best record right now. And that's the Los Angeles Dodgers. They are just running away with the best record. And so the top two uh, wild cards for the National League, the Arizona Diamondbacks are first by half a game. The second wild card is the Rockies right now, and they're up five and a half games on the Brewers. So the Brewers either need to beat out the Cubs or pick it up. Now, some other things I wanted to go over before we go into specific uh, topics. Uh, Arya Passan, I'm butchering, butchering this name. It's a Notre Dame great. Uh, Arya Passan, he died at age four. 94. He led Notre Dame to the 66th and 73rd national championship. Uh, our hearts out to his family as they grieve this loss, but a great man. Uh, just overall, he had a, I, 94 years. I hope he had a great life. That's a long time to live. And let's get into the NFL.
So now that we're talking about specifics, let's start with the Kaepernick and Ravens flirting with each other. Um, first off, I thought it was a great deal. I'm surprised they still haven't signed Kaepernick. And they came out this week saying everyone's on board except the owner for signing Kaepernick. Now, this goes back to is he blackballing? I do not because it's public knowledge. Once again, it's not a secret campaign. So by definition, it is not blackballing. People need to realize that's the definition is a secret campaign against someone to purposely not allow them to succeed. So in a sense, if the information wasn't out there already that te owners don't like them and if teams, you know, were, oh, how do I say this? If teams weren't already open saying that his, they don't like how open he is about his uh, work in helping others, especially the just his activism, if it was a little more not as public and not as highly public size, he would probably have a job right now, but since he's so over the top of it, I will say. I mean, it's not bad that he's doing it. It's just bad how he's gone about some of it. And quite frankly, it's a little disappointing that he decided that's what he wanted to do. He missed out on a lot of chances. And it's just going to hurt him. And Ray Lewis even came out and said, you know, it's good that you're being an activist, but just keep that on the low. Focus on football if you want this position. And I think that's great advice. That's pretty much how it is. You don't have to stop. Just don't make it as public size. And I think that's going to be hard for him. So looking at some other news this week, training camps opened, of course. So what's the first thing we hear about? Injuries. And one of the reasons why the Ravens were flirting was because Joe Flacco was hurt, like I said before, I believe. Now, with that, I also have a list of other injuries. Luck could possibly miss six games with a shoulder injury. It's right now just... I like how my S's are coming out. So, with Luck, he's waiting. He's going to make sure everything's all right before attempting to get hurt worse, basically. So he's going to rest it for now. Um, other injuries, J.I.J. had a concussion, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. The Rams easily torn an ACL. He'll be out for the year. Uh, Tannehill got hurt, got hit awkwardly. James Conner of the Pittsburgh Steelers has a sprained AC joint, which... <laughs> funny, funny. I didn't know all about that. Uh, Lamp, the rookie from, I almost said San Diego, but they're the Los Angeles Chargers. He has an ACL injury. Uh, and, of course, Will Fuller breaks his collarbone. I can only imagine how long he's out for. Collarbones are very, very particular and varies amongst people. But... One last thing before we get into fantasy football for the NFL segment. Uh, Gil Stephen Gilmore and Julian Edelman got kicked out of training camp for fighting. Uh, if you don't know the New England Patriots philosophy, it's if you fight, we are going to kick you out of camp. So they were kicked out uh, for the day, I assumed. I haven't heard anything about extended suspension from camp or ex whatever you want to call it. So with that, that's the most I have for the NFL right now. Let's go ahead and dive into some fantasy football. So I play fantasy football. I've played since probably 2006. So with it being 2017, that's about 11 years. I've read up on it a lot. It's just been something I've enjoyed, and by read up on it, I've probably been reading about it since. 
elementary school. Since 2006, I was a sophomore. Wow. Yeah. So, looking at fantasy football this year, I I know I could talk about all my leagues. I'm choosing to potentially talk about three of my teams. I know the one is a friend of mine, Andre Martin's uh, Fantasy Football League. I'll be talking about that team a lot. Uh, another one is the Northwest Ohio League, ran by Aaron Baker, another friend of mine. I will be talking about that team. And then the league I'm potentially talking about, and I say potentially only because my commissioner hasn't reactivated the league yet, but it's my longest running league. And pardon my French, it's called the Astastic League. And still need my commissioner, Jordan Miller, to activate the league. <laughs> so I may be sending him a text here shortly. Uh, sometime this next week or so, just to see what's going on. The uh, reason why I want to want to talk about that league, I'm currently the two-time defending champion of that league, uh, and the other th common thing amongst all these leagues are they're all my ESPN leagues. And I just, that's what I wanted to talk about with you guys. Now, another thing I've noticed a lot is... For fantasy, there's a lot of different strategies that are involved. And before I get into these strategies, let me get back to my teams. Because I want to bring you guys what's going on with me for fantasy so you know what's how well my ideas are panning out for me. So the reason why I'm not doing the... I do have an NFL.com league is because it'll already be public size enough. I don't think I need to add to that at all, and thus why I'm not going to talk about it on here. I will straight, <laughs> will just straight talk about my ESPN leagues. Uh, it'll either be two or three. I hope it's three. I really hope my longest running league doesn't end. So, Jordan, I'm calling you out. <laughs> please, oh, please, let the league just continue. So now, into the strategies for the coming year. These strategies are very intriguing for some. Now, as I was reading on, like, what strategies there are in fantasy... The first thing I notice is I've noticed a lot of people try the quarterback strategy. Now, what's the quarterback strategy? Well, the quarterback strategy is <laughs> sorry. I'm, so as I'm talking to you guys about this, I'm also seeing they came out with another how to do an auction draft. But anyways, moving on. The reason why I don't personally like the quarterback strategy when you do the NFL draft or the fantasy football draft is when you look at the quarterbacks, you have the top guy averaging about, say, 028. a game, and then... You have like 28 a game versus the lowest end, which is, sorry, everyone. I just, I want to make sure I have the article up and for some reason it's not coming up. So the quarterback strategy, I don't like. <laughs> sorry, I'm just seeing all these. It, you know, now that I think about it, it might have been Bleacher Report. I was going to say ESPN. Yep, it's Bleacher Report. So the quarterback strategy I've never been a fan of because if you look at these stats they have here, the top starter 
has roughly 27 and a half, so I said 28, that's about right. And the last starter has about six, or 21.3 or 21 as I said. So instead of, it's almost so minuscule, you have about a six fantasy point difference. And why I say minuscule is because when you look at the tight end position, that's even worse. Where the top starter is at 14 and the last starter is at 11. And that's a three point difference. Now, my personal strategy is the stockpile running backs. And the reason why is because you look at the top starter versus the last starter, you got 26, almost 27 points. And the last starter is about 13. That's 13 points difference. To get two of the top running backs helps tremendously. And the reason for it is because when you think running backs, there's so many of them, and so many teams are splitting into the two back system, but the ones that still don't give you what you need. And the only other position I could think of, wide receiver, they are 21 almost points a game versus 11. And that's a nine point difference. I mean, it's 10 for the math I gave you, but on the sheet it's 20.5 to 11.5. That's nine. So, I mean, you're looking at running backs and wide receivers. However, so, reason why quarterbacks are intriguing is because there's been years where you could get a Matthew Stafford in such a late round and Matthew Stafford you think oh he's not the best quarterback well he's going to be better this year with all his people back except for Anquan Bolden who could be better if they get a younger guy. Uh, I mean, you have Marcus Mariota, you have Philip Rivers, those are just a few names to mention. However, Bleacher Report says stay away from these two guys, which is Andrew Luck, who's for some reason getting it hurt all the time now. And the other one's always been a backup quarterback when I select, and that's Ben Roethlisberger. Now, I know my boy, well, I know my former partner, Ted Tate, would argue he's a sleeper pick, not a do-not-touch pick. However, here's the reason. I think this is a very accurate reading. Ben Roethlisberger has been inconsistent at times. And it's not that he plays bad. It's that Antonio Brown does well, of course. Le'Veon Bell does well, of course. But Roethlisberger's usually just average. And for Brown to like explode point-wise, it's kind of like, hey, what's going on type deal. Now, let's get to the running back strategy. The one I personally live by and I personally try to do it has produced championships for me and also has produced winning regular seasons for me. So let's talk about it. Now, as I said, the point differences are just so crazy. The reason why you wouldn't want certain people is because of the split back system. Now, for the people they want you to look at, so there's Danny Woodhead of the Ravens, which... Hey, the Ravens need to need him to be a great PPR guy. And for most of my leagues, that's what I run. And with Kenneth Dixon out for the year with a torn meniscus for the Ravens, he's just going to have a bigger role. Now, one more before I get to the biggest surprise. Now, Frank Gore has always been a great back. He's 34 years old, topped 1,000 total yards every year since his rookie season in 2005. Why is he so good? Well, with Andrew Luck having his injury issues, Gore may be the guy who Indianapolis just needs to lean on more. And 
quite frankly, Indianapolis needs to figure something out. They can't go 7-9 and nine over and over again. So Gore's probably going to get more touches early on to get him his stats. So the biggest surprise to me was Paul Perkins of the Giants. In May, this is quoting from Bleacher Report, in May, Giants head coach declared Perkins would be this team's starter in 2017. While his 4.1 yards per carry in 2016 wasn't eye-popping, it was nearly a half a yard better than fellow running backs Darkwa and Bobby Rainey. Giants running backs coach Craig Johnson believes Perkins could be a possible back on all three downs. He isn't likely to win leagues single-handedly this season. But if you want your third guy, your flex, or even if you're in a double running back league, you need probably want this guy. He will probably get you that low end of 13 or 15 a game. Maybe even 10 or 11. Now, the stay away ones, I, I don't think they're, oh my God, do not touch them, personally. The first one, maybe, but as we saw with Le'Veon Bell, it won't matter. So the first one is Ezekiel Elliott. They want you to stay away from uh, okay, yeah, he has a possible suspension. I think it's going to be a four reduced down to a two. Uh, the vast majority of runners who hit that number experienced a significant drop in production. So what that means is he had 370 touches, and they say he's going to have a drop in production this year. It's possible. With Prescott, it's very possible. Now... Do I think he still gets his numbers? Yes, I, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> now, is it safe to say his numbers won't be as good as last year? Yeah, I, I can see that too. But I still think he will be fine. He will be a decent running back in this league. Now, this next one, I understand the worry they have with this guy. I do. Being a Bears fan, I understand. It's my boy Jordan Howard. Yes, they said to tread lightly with the league's leading two rushers last year. It's not the workload that they're worried about. It's what's going on with the Bears. Now, what I say by that is, you look at Todd Gurley, for example. He exploded. His sophomore year plummeted greatly. And quite frankly, I avoided him as much as I can in most leagues because I thought he would not perform to the standards he had the year before. Now, would I draft Jordan Howard this year? Yes. Would I draft Ezekiel Elliott this year? Yes. But I would also make sure I get another running back that's a solid running back. These guys will be starters for a team, but will they produce like last year? Potentially and potentially not. The one worry with Jordan Howard is with Mike Lennon back there, are you going to be able to to spread the defense enough to open up your lanes. My thoughts, I'm going to say he still performs very well. I think he's a top five running back in the league. They have him as the seventh ranked uh, predicted. And I think, you know, if that's the case, I think that's very reasonable because he will be a top running back again. I think Mike Lennon still spreads it out enough that now will will he be able to throw the deep ball? We'll have to see. I He was able to with Tampa Bay. I think he will be able to here. It's just a matter of how will our receivers perform, our biggest question mark. And speaking of receivers, let's talk about the wide receiver strategy. So the reason why some people also love the wide receivers, you get like a superstar wide receiver right away. You're good. So let's talk about some of these guys. You have, of course, the Antonio Brown. And you have some eh, type players like Doug Baldwin and Jarvis Landry, but they can explode at any time. So why is that interesting? Well, Tony Brown, of course, is a must-target. He will get his numbers guy until something happens, hoping he's okay. 
I wish no harm on anyone. I'm already a little shocked at the injuries this year. So let's talk about some of the guys they want you to look at. So looking, you have Larry Fitzgerald, one of the guys they want you to look at. And they here's the quotes from Bleacher Report again. Undervaluing Fitzgerald has become some kind of bizarre annual ritual in fantasy football. Last year, he caught 107 passes, topped 1,000 receiving yards, finished ninth in points per reception fantasy points. Not bad. The year before, it was 109 and 1,200 yards and a seventh place finish. Seventh place finish, sorry. Yet, people are still not respecting Larry Fitzgerald. Would I draft him this year? Yes. He's a, from being the outside presence he used to be to being a great over the middle guy. He's performing well. Now, this next one. I'm a little iffy because I think the what they said might be the other one. So Jamison Crowder is the Washington Redskins number two guy right now. He has always been a decent receiver, but now he instead of Deshaun Jackson and Pierre Gasson, he only has Terrell Pryor. Now, they're saying that Crowder should lead the team in receptions and finish a lot higher in the PPR format. Do I think that's possible? Yes. And I also think Terrell Pryor will do amazing for Washington. But is it going to work, as some will say? I think it will, and I think it greatly will be... I think the Redskins could be a little better than initially thought, but I think they're still the bottom of the barrel in that NFC East. So the last one they want you to keep an eye on, and quite frankly, it's funny. Kenny Britt of the Browns. A lot of people I knew weren't a fan of, let's sign Kenny Britt and let Terrell Pryor walk. Now, he fin he last year alone he was a top thirty player, had a thousand receiving yards, and he played for the Rams. What will he do? And they expect a lot from him. I just disagree, and that's because yeah, they're going to be passing a lot, but I don't think it'll be anything like they're expecting, where he catches stuff and makes big plays. So the stay away players, the first one's shocking to me. It's DeAndre Hopkins. Showed two years ago what he's capable of. 111 passes, and he went over 1,500 yards and 11 touchdowns. Fell off a cliff last year thanks to rotten quarterback play. Will that be better with Tom Savage and or Deshaun Watson? Maybe. How do I feel about this for DeAndre Hopkins? Um, personally, I think it's going to be interesting. Will I draft DeAndre Hopkins? Probably not, unless he drops a lot. Uh, but, I mean, he has the talent. He just needs a quarterback to throw to him. This other one's another intriguing one, because all I heard for a while was talk about this, of course. And I say I heard about it because there, there's been a change in my life recently so now I don't hear about it anymore so talking about Martavius Bryant of the Steelers and they call him one of the most dangerous deep threats he's coming off a year long suspension which is true he's never played more than 11 games and he's never topped 765 receiving yards so here's an interesting thing Bryant still can't practice. He can't play in a preseason game. And he's not fully reinstated yet. What? Yeah. All these things are issues. Now, if he's like your last option 
of your draft, that's reasonable. But for a number two who's not practicing, not going to play in the preseason until he's fully reinstated, and he's not fully reinstated yet. And that was announced by General Manager Kevin Colbert of the Steelers on July 27th. So, yeah, that's not good. So, I, I can understand staying away from him. So, the tight end strategy. I don't know very many people who do this. However, if you go Gronk, he's the guy you're going to go with. Now, recently there's been Travis Kelsey, who's come out on the scene really well for Kansas City. I don't know how or if that will continue. Then you have the Greg Olsons and the Jimmy Grahams and the Tyler Eiferts and the Delaney Walkers. And of course, Kyle Rudolph. And a lot of people say Hunter Henry for the Los Angeles Chargers, but don't forget Antonio Gates. So what does this mean? Well, this means there's a lot of people who people want you to get. So let's talk about the ones Bleacher Report say look for. So the of course Greg goes Olson, who oh Mike Martz, I still disagree with you wholeheartedly on letting him go to the Panthers. And I say Mike Martz because Tressman or no, it wasn't even Tressman, it was Levy Smith let Martz make the decision. And it was just disappointing. It was a great talented player and Jay Cutler could have benefited more from it. So looking at it, they're saying he's been consistent. He's always a thousand yards receiving at least. Got 75 passes thrown his way, or caught I should say. And he's usually top five. There are new faces. They mentioned Christian McCaffrey and Curtis Samuel. But when you think about it, a quarterback's best friend is a tight end. He's going to dump it off to the tight end when he's in trouble. Now for the Colts, who, this was kind of shocking. Jack Doyle is someone they wanted you to draft. Isn't going to go in the top five of the position now. He's probably not. Andrew Luck has made good use of his tight ends in the past, which is true. And if the signal caller is unavailable, Scott Tolson is certainly be looking to the tight ends often after struggling early this offseason. I mean, if you think about it, he's supposed to be the number one guy, and I just don't see a lot happening for him. Now, Seth Devolve of the Browns. Wow, this is an interesting pick. And Devolve is such a dart throw that he isn't even listed on Fantasy Pro's ADP info. But the second pro... Year Pro has drawn early raves in camp as a potential breakout player. Yes, that's probably just camp speak, but he is a converted wideout, and David Njoku has struggled to adjust to the NFL. Well, they say this is a Hail Mary for deep leagues, Seth Devolve. A person I would like to mention who I've heard nothing but rave to look at is Adam Shaheen, which... If I do anything, he might be my backup, but until he proves something on the field, he, I might not draft him. But Adam Shaheen is a great, so far, camp guy. He's shown nothing but ability. This training camp, workouts, he's hopefully going to have a very productive season and productive career. So who do they say to stay away from? Gronk. Shocker. This guy gets hurt a lot. He, if he's there in the second round, it's tempting, but I doubt it. Now, I mean, it's obvious why people don't want Gronk, and it's obvious why people want him. So, let's talk about this other guy first. Well, now, because, I mean, it's obvious for Gronk. He's going to get hurt, or he will, he's either going to do really well, or he's going to bust. Now... This other guy, Martellus Bennett. Why is he a stay away? From an NFL's perspective, Bennett's 
addition was a great pickup for the Packers, another weapon for an already loaded Green Bay offense. Fantasy owners looking for a return to Bennett's 90-catch heyday are setting themselves up to be disappointed. Why? Aaron Rodgers has so, 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 so many weapons. And I say that because I hate the Packers. And at the same time, you have to respect all the weapons they have. You have Adams. You have Jordy Nelson. You have Randall Cobb. You have, oh, a name's escaping me. Ty Montgomery. There you go. You have, of course, Aaron Rodgers. You have. No, Martellus Bennett right there. Like, if you take away Rodgers, you have about five guys you need to pass to, and it's going to be hard to feed everybody. So that's why they're saying stay away from Martellus Bennett. So now let's go into kicker and defense strategy. Which, oh, my God, I've seen it. I've never seen it pan out. Maybe the defense one, but even then you have to draft better. Now, this is hilarious, and it's so, so true. Here's the only acceptable fantasy draft strategy for kickers. Draft one with your last pick, not before. Why? There's no point to not draft one later. It might seem worthwhile to spend a slightly earlier pick on a higher-end option like Justin Tucker of the Ravens, but kickers are an unpredictable lot, and it's very true. So here's the stat that will be interesting. The number one fantasy kicker and the number 12 kicker was only two fantasy points difference. And that's all you need to know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyways, I mean, for kickers, that's pretty much it. Similarly, some owners may be tempted to burn a slightly earlier pick on a premier fantasy defense. The Cardinals are top three production each of the last two years. And get four games this year against the Rams and 49ers. I mean, I've been, I will admit, I've been the guy who goes after the top ranked defense, so like the Cardinals. However, there's, they say there's at least five teams. <sighs> Moving on from the five teams, the five teams they're mentioning are the highly favorable opponents. So that'd be the Jets, Browns, Bears, Rams, and 49ers. If you're curious, I mean, if you're a big NFL guy, you will already know these are pretty much what's going to happen. Now, so now let's talk about some of the defenses and kickers that they want you to look for and also stay away from. Now, the Panthers, they... Or have been a top five in fantasy points for each of the last two years, and they open up with the 49ers. That's that's good for them. And then the Bills defense is another one. They open up with the Jets, and of course they played the Jets twice. So that's another team to look for. Now the kicker they want, Will Lutz. He isn't being drafted, they said. He's a second-year guy, and he was ranked fourth in fantasy points among kickers for the second half of 2016. That's really good. Now, do I think the Saints struggle? No. I think Will Lutz is a good idea for a kicker. So keep an eye out on him. Let's talk about the ones they want you to stay away from. The Chiefs, which the only reason why they want you to stay away from them is because their season opener is against New England, and you don't know how anybody... Anybody. They also don't want you to reach for the Chiefs when you could get like a Kenny Britt or a Tyrell Williams. They also don't want you to get Justin Tucker because you don't know how bad the Ravens offense is going to be. It was supposed to be bad, but quite frankly, it's going to get worse. And with that, that's the rest. That's what I have for the NFL. Let's go ahead and move on to the NBA. So the NBA, so a few things. First, there was 
Allen Iverson, you know, showed the big three game in Dallas this past weekend, meaning he's getting a one game suspension from Ice Cube. Yeah. <laughs> and the next thing I want to talk about is a, another article. It's an ESPN article. It's about nine teams that could become super teams. So let's start with the, they have different models. The first model is the heat model, which is built through free agency. The first one through this that they have is the Los Angeles Lakers. And what better way to have just a lot of cap space? They have LeBron James possibly and Paul George next year, Russell Westbrook. Uh, it's just perfect for them. They are just set up to make a big splash next year. And that's with trading Jordan Clarkson's, potentially even trading Julius Randle or renouncing his rights in free agency. Uh, you got Brooke Lopez's expiring contract. Uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope's contracts a year. Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram is both young, so they're on favorable contracts. It's just perfect for them to build through the free agency. The next thing they have is the Spurs, which when you think of build through the free agency, that's not the first one you want to hear about. Why is that? Because the Spurs have Marcus Holdridge, they have Danny Green, they have Rudy Gay, but they could all opt out of their contracts next year, meaning you could go after LeBron James or Chris Paul or Paul George or anybody. They have a good, good team already, and adding another person would just make it better. Now, the dark horse for this model was the Chicago Bulls. They've cleared the decks for the future, as I'm quoting ESPN, sorry. By trading Jimmy Butler, they're officially hitting the reset on the Tom Thibodeau era. Zach Levine has a free agent cap hold. Uh, what else? They need a magnetic star, but they can. They need like Kyrie or a lots of ball, really. Wow. And they're saying maybe Chris Dunn, Laurie Markkinen, or Levine can prove us wrong, but we're not betting on a star rising in Chicago anytime. So they could get someone or just build the team through free agency with Dwayne Wade there still. So the second model they like to use for these super teams. And it's interesting that they bring up super teams. Because then we do say it, super teams. <laughs> the Boston Celtics of 2008 model, which is building using trade assets. So what were those trades? Well, they executed two blockbuster trades to bring Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen to put them next to Paul Pierce. They sent Jeff Green to Seattle for Ray Allen and Glenn Davis. And then they received Garnett in exchange for Al Jefferson, two future first round picks and role players. And of course, everyone knows they went on and won the title. And the first team to be compared to this 2008 Celtics team, the Boston Celtics. Now, what they have right now is Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Jay Crowder, all great, along with first round pick, first round pick, first round pick, first round pick. Yeah, they're just, they're really stocking up on those first round picks. What else do they have? They have Gordon Hayward right now and Al Horford. Wow. And who's the first person they always love to bring up? Anthony Davis. Could they get a trade for Anthony Davis? I don't know. So what they also bring up DeMarcus Cousins, who just so happens also be a Pelican. But I think Davis is the better form because you can put him at the four. He will stretch and let Al Horford just roam the paint. 
Uh, they, I mean, they go on to keep complaining about how bad the Pelicans are and how they need this trade to happen. And quite frankly, they don't need to trade anybody. But you'll see what happens this coming year. But the Celtics are the first team they can build through trades. The second team, the Suns. Devin Booker's 20. Josh Jackson, who they just drafted, is 20. Dragon Bender's 19. And Marquise Chris is 20. That's a young core right there. You know what else they're big with right now? They're also big with being the talk of the town with Kyrie Irving. And they go on to mention that. Sorry, trying to grab my pen. I like to fidget with something while I'm talking. So, getting Kyrie would change the landscape there. Getting rid of Bledsoe helps Devin Booker be a main get focus. Kyrie's going to get his, of course, but he's also going to distribute to these young guns. And quite frankly, that's kind of what we're looking at right now for them. The other things to look at is you could get some other names to go to the Suns potentially, like a Porzingis, Blake Griffin, Clay Thompson. But the, the third team in this model, they call them the Dark Horse. And they are saying the process is starting to turn into results. They signed J.J. Redick. They signed Amir Johnson, both to big one-year deals. They got Markel Fultz. They have Ben Simmons. They have Dario Sark. They have Joel Embiid. They have Robert Cummington. Not to mention they have... Oh my gosh, I can't believe... Jalil... I believe it's Jalil Okafor. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on his name. I'm pretty sure it's Jalil Okafor. Yes, it's Jalil Okafor. Now, Jalil hasn't been panning out for the 76ers so far, but that's still to me to remain to be seen. Uh, with Embiid, he's, they still have $50 million in cap space. Oh, sorry. So, I mean, you can sign a whole, you can sign an aging vet with this team and they could be really good. So the final thing they want to talk about is the 2014 Warriors model, build through the draft. Now, everyone's going to be like, well, the Warriors, well, think about this. They were good in 2014. 2015, they won the championship. 2016, wow. Scratch that. 2014, they won the championship. 15 was the Cavs. 16 was the Warriors again. Sorry. You have to think of last year as 2016. This year's 2017. We haven't got this year yet. So that's how you have to think about it. With the contender brewing, the team that then added Andre Godala and Andrew Rowe get through trades. After winning a title and breaking the regular season wins record, Durant joined and yeah. So, who's the first team they mentioned to be the next Warriors? The Nuggets. Interesting. So, why them? After Nokola Jokic joined the starting lineup in December 15th, the Nuggets owned the best NBA's best offensive rating for the rest of the season. 113.3 points pre 100 possessions. Yeah, that caught the rest of the NBA by surprise, too. Yeah, that's an intriguing stat. They have a talented guard in Jamal Murray. They have Gary Harris, a sweet shooting, a sweet shooting guard. Kenneth Fareed has been just a solid rebounder his entire time there. Paul Millsap just got there. And let's not forget... Emmanuel Moutier. 
and it may not be done, they said. With some cap creativity, the Nuggets could have up to $45 million in cap space. To add an already strong core of Paul Millsap, Nikola Jokic, uh, Murray, and Harris. If Denver declines Jokic's team option, he would join Harris in next summer's restricted free agent class and giving him more flexibility next summer. Excuse me. And they're saying don't look, overlook Chris Paul as a target. We'll have to see how Chris Paul does. But this, they say they're the runner-ups, but I would have made them the number one team in this model, but the Milwaukee Bucks. This is another stud core built through the draft. You got Giannis Antetokounmpo, Antetokounmpo, or the Greek freak, if you just want to make it easy on me. Jabari Parker, Malcolm Brogdon, and Thon Maker. They were all selections. Milwaukee also traded for Chris Middleton, and he's been great. The Bucks have indeed hit the jackpot in the draft, but the Bucks own the future slogan. Could be soon running on fumes. Look at the cap sheet. They have a mil hundred million dollars in salary, just two million below the cap. Thanks to some questionable long-term free agent signings and Talatokovic, Matthew Deladova, and John Henson. Now, for the rude two old front office will be whether to pay up for Parker after two ACL tears when he becomes a restricted free agent next year. As of now, it seems as if the only way to build a super team is from within. The Bucks could be a tax team next summer if Parker's new contract commands a salary north of $20 million. Still, the East Conference is looking at a scary team in the Bucks. Now, they're also saying the Dark Horse are the third team for this strategy, which is the Sacramento Kings. They're mentioning Sacramento because of De'Aaron De Fox, Buddy Heald, who they traded for with the Pelicans, Willie Cauley-Stein, Scal Labissiri, Justin Jackson, and Harry Giles. And they all have what they are calling a sky-high ceiling, and they do. And they just got George Hill, Zach Randolph, and Vince Carter. And they say they're a long ways away from seeing if the Kings have something that resembles a playoff team. But in all honesty, the seeds have been planted. And quite frankly, the team sounds very promising if players play up to their abilities. And it's very possible they don't. And it's very possible they do. Now, for the NCAA basketball. First up, I want to talk about two things. Western Kentucky Grant's release of five-star freshman Mitchell Robinson, who joined Western Kentucky on the hopes that, I think it was, let me look it up real quick. Just the, So what happened was he was a highly touted recruit, of course, five stars, committed to Western Kentucky. Everyone was shocked. Excuse me. And it's all because of, let's see. Don't see it in that article. I'll keep looking, but pretty much what happened was he's a five star, seven footer. He chose the school because of his godfather, Shaman Williams, used to work there. However, they abruptly forced him to resign.
and I'm looking to see if there was any reason behind it besides he just resigned. Nope, don't see anything, but anyways, he's a seven footer. He was granted his release, which was awesome for him. And teams are going to be scrambling to sign this five-star recruit before the next season starts. So keep that in mind. Uh, in AAU news, well, before I get to this, one more thing before I get into the another big long rant. Uh, so Dayton Sam Miller, he's a junior or sophomore, and is facing charges for assault and drunken orderly disconduct and some others. But pretty much he got in a fight in a holding cell in a jail and for no reason, being an intoxicated college kid, he decided to start throwing punches. And of course, the, re the video went viral because he got knocked out. Uh, at first I thought, oh, he got knocked out. That's not good. And then I saw the rest of the video, the beginning, where it shows him initiating it, him causing the issues, and quite frankly, looking at the games, Last year, he only averaged about 12 minutes a game. He averaged roughly five points. He probably would have seen a bigger role this year, but that is not the case. The, next, the final topic that I really wanted to get to, AAU news. Adidas pulls a female official because LaVar Ball ask for her removal after receiving a technical. So what does this mean? First off, the, offici the officiating group is cutting ties with Adidas because of this. Second, LeVar goes on his rant of she doesn't belong here. She's a Division I women's college basketball referee. She knows how to call a game. So, sorry for that. Let me just do that. There we go. Don't need to listen to LeVar because LeVar's opinions will be reality TV soon enough anyways. Now, LeVar did get ejected from the game, and a source said Adidas didn't want refs to eject LeVar. Shocking. He brings in people. But here's the thing that bothers me about this. As much as the world's trying to be as PC as possible, we still have these, and by PC I mean politically correct. We are running into these issues still. A woman can referee a men's game. There's a woman coaching men's teams. There's nothing wrong with any of this. What I have is, as a coach, and as, as a coach and as a player, you essentially sign a contract of whoever the AD, the league organization, the league. I say league, but it would be like the OHSAA, the overseeing body that you're playing under. Hired referees, and you just accept the... Now, you just accept the social injustice of some of the calls sometimes. So what I mean by this is, I don't know what happened, I wasn't there, so I can't really say what LeVar did. But, I will say, I want to see what happened. But anyways, what I was getting at, let me, reel it back in. So what I'm saying is if 
I feel like all the calls are going against me and whatnot. I could see an issue. Now, I don't know if this was a tournament game or if it was just the round robin play. However, if it was tournament, there should already be a backup referee, which there was. But again, it comes down to what were the calls made, what calls weren't made. I'm not there to watch. Yes, LeVar is making it worse than it is. And quite frankly, it's just, it's hard to be a referee or an umpire. And the people that do it have to be thick skinned normally. And it's just, I've noticed it's also been harder for people to find those type of people. But that's what happens. And again, I guess that's how I'll end it. <laughs> So once again, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, SoundCloud's on a pause right now because once I finally get enough money, I can become a uh, unlimited pro. I will go ahead and sorry. <laughs> I will go ahead and upload episodes that aren't on there. Uh, I know there's three, two are viewed, the second and third episode right now. I will get the fourth, fifth, and the sixth episode as soon as I can. Like I said, once I'm able to afford that. Uh, another shout out to Schmoogle House Productions. Again, I know I don't have as big as a fan base as they do, but I like to shout out to them. Uh, another shout out to Atai Gaming, uh, reasoning for shouting out to them, it's my other venture, uh, please watch it, we are, the revival is real, uh, pretty soon we will start having videos release, and I would love to see people come back and just view the old videos, uh, I will put some links in the description on YouTube, so check that out, and have a nice rest of your day. So say goodbye and hit the road, pack it up and disappear, you better have some place to go, cause you can't come back around.